So in, in today's training, what we wanted to talk about, some, some of you guys have been asking, you know, a lot about having trouble switching people over from supplements over to MA plans. And so I want to cover a couple of things with this training today. The first thing is I want to cover, we're, we'll talk about the difference between supplements and advantage plans. And then we're also going to talk about um, what's called value-based care and macro. And then I'm going to try to transition into very specifically what things I go over and compare and some things that you guys don't think about, you know, when you're comparing advantage plans to supplements. And so the first thing that I want to start off with is that the, in, the way that the industry is going is for sure Medicare Advantage plans. You guys have seen that all across the country. Every year they're expanding into new counties. Um, Advantage plans now have overtaken supplements that exist in the country by a little bit. But if you looked at like the growth chart of the amount of people joining Advantage plans, the amount of people on supplements, it's an inverse relation. One's on the decline, you know, supplements are on the decline and the Advantage plans are really on the incline. And, you know, Medicare themselves have really had a lot of success with these Advantage plans and they are the ones that are really promoting that model at scale. And even when you look at like a, a major indicator, they send out that Medicare and you booklet every year. Now they have original Medicare and Advantage plans, right? And they compare those. They don't even really talk about supplements. And just so you guys are, are understanding and so we're on the same page, they're really two separate things, right? One is a, an ancillary add-on product, a supplement is, and the other are coordinated and ingrained and a part of Medicare. That's why in order to sell Medicare Advantage plans, each year we have to pass AHIP, we have to certify with each one of these carriers. They are regulated by CMS. Supplements are not. They are just you know traditional insurance products. They're regulated by each state. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context, as to you know supplements versus advantage plans before we really dig into this is supplements have been around as long as medicare right they were invented to go on top of people who had medicare because even even from the very start the very outset of medicare people realized there was gaps and and so it, enterprising insurance companies built these supplements that were regulated by all the state departments of insurance to go on top of those and cover those gaps. So they've been around since the mid 60s, early 60s, as long as Medicare has. Um, and, you know, traditionally, who, who sells SUPS? You've had a lot of old school insurance guys who have been selling SUPS. Um, your local PNC agent can sell you a supplement as well. That's why a lot of times you'll see so many people with a supplement plan and they never got on a drug plan because they never had a, an agent or anybody who helped them. And a lot of the guys that sell supplements don't even bother with a drug plan, drug plan. So they've really kind of done a disservice to a lot of their clients. Um, and, and the other thing is, is as I've been in this industry, especially over the past 10 years, you've almost had two different schools of thoughts or two different agents, guys that are, you know, supplement sellers and pro sup pushers, and then people who are, you know, have been on the advantage plan side of things. We want you to be able to best help whatever your customer needs, right? Sometimes that's gonna be a supplement. A lot of times it's gonna be an advantage plan and we want you to be able to determine what's best for each, be able to accurately explain the differences and be able to identify what's gonna serve um, these clients the best way. So, however, there has been a bias of, of a, you'll get a lot of people that are like, supplement, supplement, supplements, you know, those are the only ones. Anything else is is a complete disservice to your client. You know, if you can afford a supplement, you get on a supplement. If not, you get that discount ghetto insurance, you know, called an advantage plan. And that's kind of that's mostly been a mindset of a lot of these insurance agents that have been doing that for a long time. And, you know, 10, 12 years ago, that was maybe kind of true. But really, there's been so many different advances in like the advantage plan model that that's really kind of changed over and so i want to talk about just some of these things in general and um let you guys kind of know how everything works and so you can explain these to your customers but most importantly i want to evolve your mindsets all from 
thinking that a supplement is a superior plan and program and that rich people and people can afford them should get those and everybody else gets discount Medicare Advantage plans because that's not true. And I'll explain to you why that is. Um, I know that a lot of you worked at like former telesales places where, you know, supplements weren't really pushed or you kind of d developed or evolved into a mindset of all these people have a supplement. I, I can't ever, I should never mess with them or tell them, you know, anything that they should do uh, because they're already on superior coverage. Right. Um, and, and so let's go ahead and talk about, you know, quickly the differences between, um, you know, a supplement and an advantage plan. How many, who knows how many different, like how, someone briefly explain to me, how does a supplement work? Yeah. 20% the Medicare 20% the Medicare, to varying degrees, right? And there, and there used to be a whole host of supplements, A through N and J, and you guys will probably the older person you find on a supplement, you'll find, you know, a, a J plan or a K plan or, you know, all the letters of the alphabet, and they all had slight varying degrees, but for the most part, they cover the the extra 20% that Medicare didn't cover, and some of them had deductibles still, some of them have pints of blood that you have to cover, some of them um, didn't pay Medicare deductibles, you have high deductible supplements, but it, it was very complicated and convoluted, and so Medicare has been pairing those back with each legislation over the past 10 years. And so one of the things that I want to talk about is macro. And I'm, I'm on this page right here, and this is just a quick one I Googled. But um, you guys really should spend some time learning about macro. And this stands for the Medicare um, reauthorization, what is macro? Medicare Author Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015, okay? And so this was a major one. So what happened was when Obamacare came out, um, there was there were instituted with Medicare and CMS a lot of different measures that these insurance carriers had to jump through measurements, metrics, performance things that they had to achieve in order for them to get full reimbursement rates from Medicare. And it was kind of meant to a lot of people thought that they were going to damage the Advantage Plan program back then, and that you know the Obamacare stuff was going to the ACA was going to try to take as much of that as possible. And what it did was it made these plans even 10 years ago, they had to start performing better to get more money, right? And when I mean performing better, that's why you have your stars ratings and all of that. MACRA really took that to the next level and it passed in 2015, but it took about three years to be fully implemented into our business. And so what that really did is it reinforced this value-based care model it um, brought in something called STARS and HEDIS, H-E-D-I-S. We're not going to get into all of those details right now at this training, but I, I strongly encourage you guys to read and understand how those things work because the focus went to value-based care. Part of MACRA also eliminated those supplement plan Fs going forward for anybody who was not 65 before this January of last year. Okay, So MACRA did all of that. And so even though it passed in 2015, it took a few years to be fully implemented. And what MACRA did is it, it further solidified this model of a value-based care model um, as opposed to fee for service, okay? This sounds really nerdy and boring, but I promise you guys, if you listen to how this works, it'll make sense, sense to you and um, you'll kind of understand how these Medicare Advantage plan models work and why they can potentially be even better and people can get better help, all right? So fee-for-service, does anybody know, how does a fee-for-service work, like a billing model? Medicare is fee-for-service, correct? Original Medicare is. How does fee-for-service work? Yeah, Jared. In certain, like an office visit, it pays X amount of dollars. You don't pay more than that, don't pay less than that, whether you're with your client for the patient for five minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you get paid one file. Yep, and those flat rates are set by, it's just like a pricing model, right? That, that Medicare puts out, the government puts out. You did a you did a blood work, that's X amount of dollars. You did an initial patient, patient visit, that's X amount of dollars. Now, did Medicare pay these doctors more than private insurance or less? Less, right? 
traditionally much less. And so if you're a doctor and you're working with Medicare clients and you're on a fee for service model and you want to and and you're a doctor and you went to school for eight years and you've got 400K in medical bills and you've got a house and you've got an office and you want to make a boat payment. How do you make more money if you're on fee for service? More services, right? Yep. So you get that turnstile cranking. You get more people in. You get them served fast. You know, you get you go in and maybe you don't have time to go see all these patients, but you hire a, a PA or you hire a nurse assistant, and they're the ones that come in and they do all these other things and check your blood pressure. And only just you know the doctor comes in for quick. Oh, how you feeling, Russ? Well, you, you doing good? No big problems. All right, okay, on out the door, on to the next. I'm going to see 60 patients during that day, right? So M Medicare realized and, and the government that that necessarily wasn't always resulting in the best care. And a supplement, you know, Medicare would pay their fee. They pay, you know, whatever, whatever the fee is. Let's say you go in for primary care and you submit that money to Medicare and now you're going to get reimbursed $63 and then they bill your supplement plan that pays them an extra 12 or 20% and they get a check for $12 in between your Medicare and that supplement payment, the doctor's office is made whole, right? Well, if I'm a doctor's office, I've got to wait. Does the government pay fast usually? No. So, you know, I'm probably getting, I'm getting these two different payments and I'm on this fee for service model and I'm just trying to see as many patients as quickly as possible. And so MACRA, really kind of shifted everything and solidified this move towards value-based care. And value-based care is, in theory, is focused on health outcomes. Who knows what a health outcome is? Jerry, what's an outcome? So if somebody is diabetic and hospitalized for, say, cardiovascular issues, mm -hmm. so they're released from the hospital, the primary care is a follow-up with them, and the outcome is to not have them readmitted to the hospital to actually increase their health growth positive mm -hmm. So they're going to be rated on what's the outcome of that specific patient for that specific diagnosis. Yep. Outcomes are the results, right? Are, are, you're, you're putting X amount of care in, you're getting these treatments and services, and you're either you're getting better or you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Is the, has the United States typically been pretty good for the amount of money that we spend on healthcare in this country with outcomes? No, we suck. We're the worst in the whole developed world in as far as how much we spend in GDP in our, our like how much we spend as a country on healthcare and our overall health outcomes. And that's a whole other conversation for a different day. But we're trying to fix that, right? And so MACRA and the Advantage plans are trying to shift to a value-based care model where doctors are compensated differently rather than a fee for service they can get compensated for in different ways so they can spend the amount of time and attention that they need okay so you so what's happened is all of these advantage plans with macra they've changed the way that they contract with all of these different doctors okay so you may have a fee for service medicare advantage uh, contract with these medicare advantage plans where just like medicare um, let's say Aetna has a fee for service with this DaVita clinic down here and you go do their dialysis and Aetna sends them that fee for service payment, just like Medicare's fee for service schedule. But that payment comes from Aetna instead of the government. Typically, should that come faster than the government? Yeah. So there's a little bit of a benefit there from the doctor. Now, there's a there's a two other sorts of contracts now that these Medicare Advantage plans have. And this is really getting into you know, the next level stuff is there are what's called a value based contract, value based. And then there's a third contract that's the highest level called full risk. OK, and what value based is that instead of these doctors just getting paid a fee for service, they're getting paid for the value and the treatment that they're providing for these doctors. So the compensation levels are different. They're not getting paid to just go through everybody as quickly as possible, but they're getting paid to be more thorough, to go through these stars and HEDIS measures and almost like, that's why all of you guys are doing HRAs and health risk assessments and BBEs, because that ties into all of this value-based care. They're able to go, okay, Riley, well, what medications are you on right now? 
and what risk factors and these doctors are sitting down and they're giving you value-based care and in return they're getting paid a higher amount from these insurance carriers oh yes steve it's not necessarily disruptive for the doctor um, because the doc but it might be disruptive to the payments that they receive right and and so if and that's this whole other model of like working with doctors and you know getting them to work on these value-based contracts and things like that if a doctor is looking at their bottom line they're going to want to know well which which carriers do i have a, a fee for service contract with which one do i have a value-based contract with which one do i have a full risk contract with and oh i don't have i hate the way that Humana pays and that there's fee for service in this area. I'm not even in a contract with those people, right? So you see why there's different pockets across the country of you know why certain carriers don't have contracts with other different doctors, and it's a two-way street, right? Here in in Utah, United Healthcare, who who facilitates their risk management and their contracts with the doctors? Who is it? Optum. Okay. So Optum has made a giant big business by doing this by managing the, the risk management, by implementing these contracts, not just with United Healthcare, but with other carriers nationwide as well. They've made a whole gigantic, very lucrative business out of that by managing these payments and making sure these doctors and offices have good contracts. And now these doctors can even get paid a PMPM. So here in Utah, for example, if you're uh, United Healthcare and you're contracted with Optum and you're a PCP, you get paid a couple bucks PM, PM per member per month for all of your clients that are on Optum. Let's say you have a book of 2000 of your clients have Optum. You're getting paid a few thousand bucks every month just as a per member per month fee to manage those people. And then you get paid extra when they come in. And then as that contract, Optum expects them to go in and make sure that oh yeah, all these stars and HEDIS measures are filled out. I'm reporting all these things back. I'm making sure that there's no problems with their coordination of, of medications. I'm reaching out to this primary, this other specialist and making sure that that specialist knows that they have this health condition and I'm gonna make sure that we give them concierge care. And so PCPs are also much more important now as well. That's why we spend so much time and emphasis on primary care doctors because they really want them to be able to manage the the total picture of healthcare and they're getting paid they're getting compensated based on that okay so that's a value based contract full risk they can these doctors can make up to 130% of medicare sometimes on a full risk contract and what's that what that saying is if you follow all these medicare stars and edis measures where you're um, making sure X amount of your patients are getting their mammograms and their health care and you're reporting properly to Medicare and you're giving good care, good awarded care, then you can make way more than original Medicare. OK, and so that's a full risk contract. And that's what a lot of these carriers are moving towards. And these these contract levels in the value based care model is really only happening in advantage plans much more at scale. Now, the the government Medicare is trying to do that with even people on original Medicare. And that's why you guys are seeing so much over the past four years of a, a conglomeration of um, ACOs, accountable care organizations, and basically doctors groups and physicians networks kind of banding together. And if you sell in like Southern California, they've already been down this road a long time, right? It's like you've got this slim network and this potted network and these group of doctors over here. And they do that because it's easier for that those accountable care organizations to give you good care and to keep track of all of your health care status, kind of like the Kaiser Permanente model, right? You guys all, everybody hates when they run up against someone with Kaiser because the, the insurance plan also owns the hospitals, also owns the doctors, and all of that is kept in there. And usually, what are those plans rated? Five stars, okay? That's why they do that, because they're able to 
take all of, give great care, get all of these stars and fetus measures, get rated higher for Medicare. And guess what? If you're a, and then all of these plans, they make more money based on your star ratings. The difference that a five star plan gets from Medicare for their care, as opposed to a three and a half star plan is insane. The di you know, a three star and a three and a half, four star plan. That's why you guys have seen over the past couple of years, some of these plans where they have 60, 80,000 members um, in some of these areas and they're a three star rated plan and they'll tank that plan and, or, and open up another four star plan or another plan and they're trying to move all their membership over there because it, yeah, it might seem counterproductive, but if they can move those people to and get them on a higher star rating, the reimbursement rates that they're gonna get for Medicare on those people are infinitely higher. I mean, it's you're talking about tens of millions of dollars just shifting right there, okay? So I, I will do more detailed in-depth trainings about macro, stars, HEDIS, very specifically what those measures are. I got really, and, and me and Dan got kind of nerdy about this two years ago, and we really dove into this. And we started working with doctors, offices, and we kind of, before everything started really quickly moving virtually, we kind of saw that working with the doctors and, and doctor's offices would be the future of working with that value-based care. Now, the challenge is, because I know all of you are probably thinking, I'm gonna go make all these relationships with doctors and switch all these blocks of business. The problem is because I mentioned that there's so much corporatization and conglomerization, like you don't really go find Dr. Rick that owns his practice and him and two other doctors have 5,000 clients on their books. It's very rare for these independent physicians. And if they are, they're part of what's called an IPA. That's what an independent physician um, group is. They're all associated with other groups or other networks. And so it becomes very difficult. You have to ultimately get to who are the decision makers, who are the people that understand this, the finances, and then how can we work together to help those doctors move those blocks of business, right? Because if you had, you have 10,000 clients, Medicare clients, and 3,000 of those are on an Aetna plan that's fee for service, and the other are on, you know, 3,000 are on a Humana plan that's value-based care, but then you've got the other 4,000 that are on a United Healthcare Optum contract that's value that's full risk, and you're hitting your measures. Which plan do you want your? Would you financially want your client to be on? Optum, right? So, but getting to the people who understand that, and getting them to like financially want to put the efforts behind that to move those is pretty difficult. And so I've been doing that. You know, I'm sure I don't know if some of you have heard me talking about like the Exodus Network here and a couple other networks that we work with that we do that. But it's pretty difficult to get to the ultimate decision makers. And, you know, a lot of times I spent time going around to doctor's offices and talking to Karen at the front desk and going, oh, you do the billing? Well, I'm sure you want people on macro or because of macro, you want people you have a you have a full risk contract with Optum. And I'm sure you want your people on Optum. Does she give a crap? Does it affect her paycheck one way or the other, whether this next people if she increased the revenue for that? Um, clinic by a million dollars that year. How does that benefit her? It doesn't, right? I mean, so you've got to paint and illustrate the picture to the right people. But more importantly, what this does is this helps you all understand that these plans, these advantage plans, all are compensated based on how they perform and by giving you value-based care. That's why you have all of these Medicare Advantage companies that are also opening their own clinics and you're seeing this move towards like miniature versions of the Kaiser model. Okay. That's only going to get more prevalent. And so the way that this um, applies to all of you is ultimately people are getting more proactive care when the advantage plans are functioning properly, right? If I'm a senior and I have a doctor who's reaching out to me and making sh and and you'll I'm sure you've heard this from your clients. They call me and they always bug me to come in and and get me to get a checkup and I tell them to go to hell or whatever, right? They're doing that because they have a full risk contract or a value based risk contract with these carriers and they have to get you in to get your checkup. They want you to get your preventive care done. They want the females to get their mammograms. They want the men to get their PSAs. And is it fully altruistic? Are they doing that because they're just they took that Hippocratic oath and they want to make sure 
that, you know, all these people are getting the best care? Yeah, kind of, but they want that money, right? I mean, and they're, they're performing because they want that money and they're, they're doing the measures to get this value-based care. Well, what's happened as a result of all of this is what? What's happened? We're driving healthcare costs down. People are getting better outcomes, okay? So because people are having to go in and doctors are spending more time with them, they're catching stuff earlier, they're getting better care coordinated, the preventive care that we're getting, is it, is it cheaper to treat someone's diabetes and get them on a good and pay for a nutritional plan for them and have them come into a doctor and check their blood and make sure they're, it's regulated by medications and pay for gym membership for that person? Or is it better for them to pay for two or three hospitalizations and surgeries and amputations and all these other things that come along with chronic illnesses? What's better? I mean, it's obvious, right? And so you're seeing this value-based care model is paying out. And so Medicare is going, huh, hey, people are getting better care. We're having less people with um, acute hospitalizations and major surgeries. And even if it's just a reduction of 10% of heart attacks, 10% of hospitalizations, that equates to a lot more lives saved. That equates to a lot more um, billions of dollars saved in Medicare. And then those savings can get reinvested into healthcare. The payments can get increased, the insurance plans. And that's why I'm a nerd about Medicare Advantage plans and why I really like them is because our healthcare in this country is screwed up, right? Like I really think it's, it's very screwed up. We have, um, but the only place where I think our models are working really well is Advantage plans because you have the government doing what the government does, setting these rules and basis and eligibility and management and oversight. And then they partner with private entities who do what they do. And they come in and they implement some cost cutting measures. They're way better at managing fraud, waste and abuse than the government is obviously. So they're able to cut down on money there and they're able to turn a profit. And Medicare only allows them to profit X amount of dollars, right? They're not just, and so what happens is if they keep doing better, they keep getting better outcomes and moving the needles. And that's why you're seeing these Advantage plans getting better year to year, right? The, the Advantage plans now are much better than they were when I got into the industry. And each year for about, from 2007 to 2012, they were getting slightly worse each year because they were get, getting less and that's kind of turned. And now we're seeing people getting dental, vision, hearing, all these extra benefits added in, they're getting money back on their social security checks. Um, you've got zero PCP, you've got, you know, specialists are, are very affordable. And so it's getting better. And so that's why I'm such a fan of Advantage plans because I think it's a, a shining model of what's working well with healthcare in our country. And does that mean that every plan in every county is great? No, of course, we know that there are certain plans that suck in certain areas and, you know, the local management's not good and those plans aren't operating. But guess what? The government has a place, a model in place to where if those plans are underperforming, they're going to be replaced anyway. They're going to and someone else is going to take care of people's health. They're going to come in. So that's a quick, high level, passionate overview of like what value based care is on Advantage plans. Right. Yes, Shane. Um, especially now with that change, getting rid of the plan F, the plan G, now your lower income, middle income people on a plan G, that $203 deductible, every time you get that first time to the doctor, is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they don't, that used to be not a problem, now it's going to deter them to even go to the doctor. Yep. D so does that make they, sense? So they need to move off of that to get to a zero so they can start going to the primary doctor. Yeah. The doctor. So, you see what I'm saying is, and and Steve, we talked about this, that it was kind of like this model of, um, well, people that can afford it get supplements and then everybody else that can't afford it gets gets Advantage plans. And I, I said, yeah, I've never known a rich person that liked to waste money, you know, and, and I personally, like if I could choose in Salt Lake City, Utah right now, I would not, and I was 65, I would not pay, be paying for a supplement. I would get me a Cigna advantage plan because I'm getting money back. I get some over the counter stuff. I'm gonna have $2,000 that I can use towards dental. And 
overall, these plans, the slight trade off that they're getting, like, because a lot of people think they're trading access to I can go anywhere for I'm restricted to this small crappy net, right? And so if you can explain that and say, you know, the reason why it's, it's a different care model, right? It's, it's not that they're trying to restrict where you can go. It's they have, they have, they manage your healthcare. They're trying to keep, get you healthy and keep you healthy. And so as part of that, they have to, they can't work with everybody. Right. And where this concept of, I have to go everywhere and I want to be able to go anywhere, anytime I want ever came from in healthcare is just bizarre to me. It's been a Medicare myth that's been propagated by these same agents. You know, I mean, most of these people that are aging that have turned 65 in the past 10, 15 years came off of a retirement plan or any sort of other insurance where they were used to going to a network. Right. Everybody's used to that. And we're we're the ones that are putting more of an emphasis on that. Yeah. I had a guy the other day that started the conversation with me, like, he's like, he's like, he's like, I don't want an advantage plan because I need to travel. Mm -hmm. And then you go for your tax savings. And so when I, when I asked him, I said, okay, let me ask you, when you say travel, do you live in another state for months or are you going to Disneyland for two weeks? He goes, oh, just Disneyland for two weeks. I said, mm -hmm. okay, in your entire life, have you ever been on vacation? I thought, God, you know what I want to do while I did Disneyland? You will get a prostate exam. And he started laughing. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. that's what I'm talking about. You're covered for emergency. If you do this emergency, you break your leg, you cut your finger, you go, you're covered no matter what. But in his head, he thought, oh, I, if I travel, I have to have a, either a PPO or something. Mm -hmm. And with that, that question totally made him laugh. He goes, oh, well, no, of course not. I said, okay, then you're covered. Yeah, but that's what people have been sold and told and programmed. Yeah, yeah. If you want to travel, yeah. you have to have a supplement, okay? And I'll talk about it. Yep. The thing about the humanity is that uh, they allow you to go, like, as long as it's a humanity doctor. Yep, exactly. We'll talk about that here in just one second. I seem to find more challenges, like, they're, they're okay with the certainty of the $2,400 thing on supplement, but the uncertainty of the possibility of Maps. Sure, and we'll get, we'll get to this right here. We'll, we'll kind of model this out. I think it's important. Um, so travel, what else do people really, supplements, are, are people really thinking that there's a big advantage? Hospitalization. Hospitalization. Unexpected Okay, so the, the unexpected bills. Any doctor, I guess that would Any doctor, okay. So a lot of those are myths, right? Let's talk about travel. Advantage plans give you worldwide urgent and emergency care coverage all of them and there's no coverage limit on urgent and emergency care coverage okay medicare gives you a lifetime outside of the country on most supplements of fifty thousand dollars now if i get hit by a bus in brazil how much how much could my bill be well it's socialized there but maybe, you know, maybe, maybe. Uh, let's um but but even even okay, let's say you're you're somewhere else and you have a lot of it's pretty easy to get up there in expenses, right? Advantage plans give you worldwide urgent and emergency care coverage. Traditionally, supplements give you a lifetime fifty thousand dollar maximum coverage. So worldwide urgent and emergency care coverage, advantage plans offer just as good or better coverage when you're traveling internationally. Well, I was gonna to to, uh, I kind of use a Well, and it, and it may be, I, I know that I've had personal clients. I had a client in Centerville that had a heart attack on a cruise ship. He was helicoptered off the cruise ship to St. Kitts, air jetted from St. Kitts all the way back to Florida. That was covered from with his ER co-payment and the, and the, uh, all he paid for was the ambulance, $200 co-payment for that and the ER co-payment. And that was all covered. It was like a $30,000 bill and United Healthcare paid the rest. So they, that's a that's kind of a moot point. And like Russ said, you know, even even people who are snowbirding now, a lot of times if they're you can coordinate network. United Healthcare has their passport program in all 37 states. PPOs, you have access on these Advantage plans. And people think like, well, what if I get what what if I get what? What's the c word? Not the the dirty c word. What's the c word? <laughs> cancer right and that's what the so the two people this the sub people that sell supplements is like, well, what if you get cancer 
what if you get cancer? You know, what if you get cancer? Is it crap coverage on advantage plans? No. So, you know, that's, that's the two, the things that you get, or they have in their mind that if I get cancer, I'm going to get this rare brain cancer. And then I'm going to need to go to the Linda Loma cancer center in California. And I'm going to go see specialist Dr. Rick, and he's going to cure me. That's not how it's going to happen. And that's, and guess what? The, a lot of those facilities don't accept Medicare. So you're probably going to not be going to those facilities anyway. Some of the Cleveland clinics and the Linda Lomas, they don't accept original Medicare. Now they may have contracts with advantage plans and a lot of them are starting to have contracts with PPOs and advantage plans. So that's kind of a, a non argument there anyway. And just like Russ said, who, who would a supplement be advantageous for in the case of travel? Give me a scenario where that person may be better suited on a supplement. Sean. Um, yeah. Maybe. Yep. They, they might be going to a couple, you know, some doctors I spend half the time in. I had a client spends half the time in Montana and half the time in Arizona. And they have a couple different doctors between both, you know. Um, and so they were paying for a supplement to basically cover them there. Now, is that necessarily value-based care? How, how, how good could their care possibly be getting if I'm seeing a foot doctor down here in Arizona and I'm seeing a, then I go up here and sometimes I see this other doctor up in Idaho and I've got a PCP in both areas. And are they always, you know, sharing with each other and, hey, Rick, I just met with your client and this is what I updated him. No, right? And and so you see people getting prescribed complicating medica medications, getting different advice from different doctors, the left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing. And that's okay. It's people's they have that flexibility and that freedom of choice. And that may be a scenario where a supplement may be a good option for them. However, I'm like Russ. How many times are you out on vacation? You just want what people are mostly talking about is they want urgent and emergency care coverage, right? That's what they want 90% of the time. Now, if I have a guy that's going to go around and they're going to spend seven months of the year touring around with their wife in an RV visiting every, every 50 states, I'm probably going to say, hey, you want, you're probably going to want to supplement until you settle down, you know, indefinitely um, or some sort of PPO. But someone who already has cancer. Yeah, maybe maybe somebody that's turning 65 and they have a lot of chronic illnesses and I already know for a fact that they're going to hit their max out of pocket and they just don't want to worry about um, about paying co-payments and things like that. But those scenarios, even then, are, are becoming more farther and few between, okay? So everybody's always like, well, what about if I get cancer, cancer? You know, that's always the, that's always the thing and that's what the supplement – People sell. So give me an idea. What's like a, a typical treatment plan of cancer? I mean, on average, chemotherapy is at most, it's it's 20%. Um, that's a Part B treatment, but most are capping that now between like 60 and $80. Okay. So let's say you go, I think I'm not a cancer doctor and expert and anybody watching this video and anybody here, don't, I'm not, don't quote me on this verbatim. Like Mike said, this is how it is. Um, about eight sessions of chemotherapy, right, in a year before you have to like wait and then you go do a few more. So let's say your copayment was roughly $80 times eight. How much is that? 800 and 640 bucks. Okay. So then let's say I had um, a surgery in the hospital for two days where they removed a tumor and I'm two days of hospitalization. And then I had 10 specialist follow up visits. At thirty-five dollars a piece, I'm at three hundred and fifty bucks. I'm at six hundred and forty on that um, chemotherapy. I'm at two days of hospitalization at roughly um, three hundred bucks a pop, depending on the plan. So I'm at six hundred, twelve, four, around thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred bucks. Cancer. I'm probably seeing my primary care doctor a lot. That's assuming I'm now. Let's assume worst case scenario is your your on your deathbed of cancer and you're going all the time, you still have your max out of pocket. But typically that's not how it happens. And this, even this um, year, I had a client that I put on Aetna in Lehigh. He just lives, we could 
not throw a rock, but maybe shoot a bone arrow at his house. Um, right over here, who I put on it and on advantage plans, and he got cancer this year, and he ended up having to go out of out of network um, a couple times to see you a different specialist. So he paid a higher out of pocket copayment there. He ended up having a surgery. All, all said and done, his bills were about two thousand dollars for this year. Going into next year, I was like. He has to have a surgery up at the University of Utah. And I, I was thinking, well, I switched him from a plan F. Maybe I'll use his trial right. And so, because now he's got cancer, 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 you know? And so I, we, I sat down with him and his wife, or well, we went over this on the phone. And we compared the costs that we knew he was going to spend with, and now because of his cancer, his teeth are falling out and he has to spend a couple thousand dollars in dental work. So that's already a cost out of his pocket. Long story short, when I went and said, hey, I can put you back on this supplement, Plan F, with your trial right, it's going to be $200 a month for that um, United Plan F now at your age, and your drug plan is going to be roughly an extra 30 bucks a month. You know, you're going to be 3000 out of pocket, and that covers everything. And when we sat down and did the analysis of his surgery, his treatments based on this year that he'd had, and the fact that he was going to have to pay dental, we put him on Signet because we figured it was still going to save him $2,000 by being on this advantage plan, by being back on, on the plan F. And the lady was like, no, I don't wanna go back on that supplement. We'll just stay on the advantage plan and let's just move to Cigna where I get that extra dental. So, you know, she was smart and like, I was kind of just like, oh, well, you got cancer now, so you gotta get back on a supplement and I can do that for you. And then when we really actually went through and did the finances of it, she was like, no, that doesn't make sense. Like, let's just, I'll just pay the co-payments in the out-of-pockets. And if it gets really bad, I've got a $5,000 max out of pocket and I'm already going to pay 3000 for sure if I go that supplement route, you know. So what I'm saying is, guys, most of the time it's it's your mindset. It's your like, oh, this person has a supplement. I'm dead in the water. Right. And and or they've got superior coverage. I if I believe in something, I can sell it. I can sell it. If I don't believe in it, if I have a broken mindset about it and I secretly think I'm screwing somebody in the back of my mind, I am the worst salesman ever because my subconscious, my like my my mindset, my brain won't let me. I sold um, when I first got back from a mission, I was like, I'm hot stuff sales guy. I sold real estate mentoring over the phone. And basically the pitch was you put all your money that you possibly have available on a credit card buy this ten thousand dollar coaching program and we'll try to teach you how to flip properties and you really just got to leverage that credit card debt for the first couple of months before you close your first big hundred thousand dollar deal and then you pay all that off and you're going to be a rich man right i knew it was freaking bullcrap like i really did and, the, and i saw the coaches that these people were paying to mentor and they're driving up in like a 10 year old Mazda that's worth like three grand. And I'm like, I'm trying to hire people to pay you $10,000 to tell them how to be millionaires. I don't think so, but I tried at it real hard over the phone, but I just couldn't do it. And I eventually realized it was because I didn't believe in the product. I thought it was, I thought it was crap. And so I think that applies to a lot of you that you have, a, when you come across someone with a supplement, you have that thing in the back of your mind that, Oh, well, I can't harm this person by putting them on an advantage plan over a supplement because I'm going to screw them, right? I promise you that's not the case. And if you talk about it passionately and explain people like I'm explaining it to you, people will understand that and it'll make sense to them. And when you talk about value-based care and why you go to a doctor and why a doctor wants to actually keep track of you, you'll find that most people actually care about their health care. Surprise, surprise. And you'll find that most people, it makes sense to them to have somebody who's accountable for them and who is going to encourage them to go get the care they need. Now, that's why I'm so pissed off about this year with coronavirus and how we've just thrown all that out the window because you all are talking to people. That's a whole different topic, but how people aren't getting the care they need and they're too scared to go to the doctor and they're too scared to go pick up their medications and all that. So we're trading one bag of problems for the other. But, um, I promise you that if you explain it like that, so that's the, the one um, objection that you get is you get travel, you get cancer and max out of pocket costs. And then, so that'll bring me over here into this comparison. And I've generally found 
that this is pretty um, pretty easy to go through with people. Now, as I've told all of you who I've given this comparison tool to, is it compliant to print this out and leave this with a client? No, it is not. No, for two reasons you don't want to do that. It's not compliant and people will, if it doesn't work out just like this, I don't want someone calling me back and saying, well, you estimated that you'd save me 2042 and I only saved 2000. What the hell, Mike? So this is a, a tool that I've built to compare people's plans, okay? And the other thing that I want to point out for all of you is you are sleeping on the prescription medication portion of this big time. When you guys are trying to compare and talk to people about supplements versus Advantage plans, they are on standalone drug plans that always suck compared to the comparable Medicare Advantage drug plans, okay? The drug plans that come built in to Medicare Advantage plans are usually you'd pay an $80, $90 or more premium or they just don't exist. They're just not as good. And I'm talking as far as deductibles, co-payments, and many of you are not factoring that in when you're doing your analysis with these clients. And that is where you'll find that it'll make a gigantic difference in cost for people, okay? If you're just comparing what they're paying in premiums versus what they maybe would have paid in co-payments, it's not gonna look like a big ticker. Doing this proposal, I've estimated that I've saved people up to $15,000, a couple, a husband and wife. And do you think that those people called me back this year to change back? No, they didn't. Um, out of the hundreds of people that I've switched from supplements to Advantage plans, guess how many people, I, I switched about 80 people last year. 50 of them were down in Nephi. They'd only had supplements available. Guess how many of them called me back and wanted to go back, use their trial right and go back to supplement this year? Zero. I had none. I had no people that I put back on a on a supplement. I've never, I've never had to put How many? I'm sure you've had to do it, Dave. How many times? Yeah, very rarely. Because, and especially, what I tell people too is, on a one year basis, might you hit a max out of pocket? Yeah. How many people hit their max out of pocket two years in a row on an Advantage plan? I don't know of anybody. It's extremely rare, you know, because that person probably either would have passed away because they had, if they were getting that much health care, you know, they probably wouldn't have. Um, and, and just as a quick aside there, on Advantage plans, typically the only way that I see people hitting max out of pockets anymore are multiple hospitalizations throughout the year. You know, if they're hospitalized two or three times for more than five days throughout the year, or if they get admitted into a skilled nursing facility where they're paying, you know, they're there for 20 days. And I had a, I had one client this year that I know hit her max out of pocket, but she had surgeries, um, multiple surgeries, and then she was in a skilled nursing facility and they kept trying to kick her out within the 20 days that are no cost, but she was trying to finagle it to basically use it as long-term care. Basically saying like, well, I don't wanna leave yet. I'm not ready to leave yet. And the doctors are telling me I'm good to leave, but I don't wanna leave and my daughters don't want me to leave. Medicare is not set up for long-term care. It's not set up to cover you in a nursing home or a long-term care facility. My only client that I know that hit that this year was this lady who was adamant about staying in that skilled nursing facility for that 100 days because it was a hell of a lot cheaper for her to pay that copay and hit that max out of pocket than it was for her to go find a long-term care facility to have to check into. So it's rare to hit max out of pockets, guys. It's not typical and explain that to people. And when you go through and do these plan comparisons, um, it'll really help. So I'll start off, um, I'll send this out to you guys. And let's just look at this guy's banker's life. I'm trying to think of who this guy even is. This is the last one I did. I've built this to basically compare their current plan, like what their costs were for the whole year. This includes drug plans, drug cost deductibles, okay? And then what my proposed plan would have been. And this guy, this is a good example because this wasn't like a typical guy that had hardly any costs. This guy had costs, you know? And he was one of those ones where he was, he was thinking, oh, well, I have a lot of costs. I think I need to be on a supplement because I go to the doctor a lot. And when we sat and spent the time, this is how it shook out. So 
this guy's premiums, he was paying about, he had a banker's life premium. And you guys will find that some supplements are very affordable and some supplements are very um, expensive. Banker's life is one that's always going to be expensive. Usually United Healthcare. AARP is more on the expensive side of things. Um, the cheaper ones are usually the Aetna's, the Humana's, the Cygna's, the Mutual of Omaha's. They're usually pretty affordable no matter where you go. Occasionally, you'll find people on supplement plans that have been sunsetted now, like Plan J. Uh, I had a lady that was on a Plan J that was paying like $360 this year, and it was an easy switch for her. She was already paying more than she would have on any max out of pocket. So... Um, this guy was paying, and then he had a, he had an expensive United Healthcare drug plan. So he had that $89, um, yep. Yeah, How do you address the employer based plan when they say, let's set up to work and I can't change it? Right. I mean, well, they can, they can always change it. If somebody wants to. Yeah, if they're eligible for their for their Medicare. And they often don't know. I just take that my check. It's, it's set up through my retirement plan. And yeah, and a lot of them don't have not activated their Part B yet. And they think, like, it's going to cost them more. But really, if they paid their Part B premium and got on a zero premium advantage plan for 140, what's the 2021, 148.50? It's now 148.50 to get on a zero premium advantage plan is going to give them a lot better program than their employer plan is getting them, right? So that's the conversation and the comparison as well that you'll that you'll have to go through here. So he was paying, so yeah, he was on a plan F, paying 365, paying $13, so he had that Walmart drug plan. Um, his Part B deductible, so I put this over here as yearly, right? Look right here, guys, there's the monthly, and then this is a one-time expense. So he had a, obviously he had a plan G, um, he wasn't taking any drugs. So this guy was paying $4,742. I put him on a zero premium advantage plan. So he has no premium, no deductible on the part B. He had he'd gone to the, the specialist eight times. That's what he was really concerned about is that he'd been to it. He was like, oh, I use it so much. I'd been to specialist eight times. So I programmed that in um, and his were more expensive in this area. They were $50 a piece and he'd actually been hospitalized. Four, he had four days of hospitalization, so I built that in here too. So he, this guy, he was thinking, and he went to the primary care doctor a couple times. He was thinking, I use the doctor a lot. Like, I have to stay on this plan. I used it a whole lot this year. I went to a specialist eight times. I went to my primary care doctor a few times. I was hospitalized for four, for four days. I went and did the comparison for him, 2,200 bucks in a bad year. I estimated this guy would have saved $2,542 just in this one year. That's not nothing. And this was a guy that had gone to the doctor a significant amount of times, right? Now, what's the kicker? So I go through and I say, you know, had you been on this plan, you would have saved an estimated $2,542. Not only that, you would have also had X, a gym membership, this dental vision hearing, this over-the-counter program, if you if you want, oh, you spent X amount of dollars in dental. Well, you would have saved that. Oh, you're paying for this gym membership, thirty dollars a month. Well, you would have saved that. You would have saved this three hundred and sixty dollars, and I'm building that value into that person right there. I think you know, good point. We have to remember that they they're paying for those other things, and you have to ask those questions. Guys. Yep. To say a dental vision plan, they're paying one hundred fifty bucks a month. If you don't ask them that, they don't think it's part of it, and they go, "Oh, I can save that too." Plus the 435 deductible on my standalone, now I'm paying zero. That's another 435 dollars. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a it's rarely is it rarely is there a time where they, they should not move. Rarely ever. Is there a place for dental vision you can put in there in your comparison? You don't have drugs. Um, so this is this is all editable, right? So like right here I have additional balance bill. I found I, I found a guy up in uh, Heber who was on a plan N. And plan N, you pay those office co-payments, but you can also be balance billed. Does anybody, does everybody know what balance billing is? No. Basically, it's saying that between Medicare and what the supplement reimbursed, the doctor still wasn't whole. So they, they can still send you an additional bill over, over top of it. That's why I don't like plan N's. This guy was spending 
an additional thousand. He was one of the ones where I did the analysis between him and his wife. It was about eleven thousand dollars up in Heber. And I switched him and he was like, I go to the doctor all the time. I switched him two years ago. He's happy as a clam. Um, so you can edit these, right? So if you wanted to say dental, like you spent, like you're paying for dental insurance and it was a, it was an extra 60 bucks a month, then it should calculate that over T that just adds that in as a savings there. So I will add those things up. And by asking these additional questions, these are how you do a whole complementary analysis for people. Um, the other thing that you guys need to do, and I'll log into Sunfire real quick. Because before you go into their doctors and everything, or like you practice on the supplement, you do this right off the bat, or do you like um, you have to I mean I'll I'll generally someone says they got a supplement, when do you introduce that little person? I'll ask them, I'll say, well, you know, have you ever looked at moving to one of the advantage plans or been really popular in your area? And for all of you guys that are selling well care, I'll also send out that. I think I've sent out that call that I had that was yeah. pretty much like, I think it was that helpful yeah. just of how I transitioned that into a supplement where I'm like, yeah, we've got some new plans out. It looks like you're still on, you know, a supplement. Have you heard of one of the, of these new advantage plans that are so popular out there? And then right away, people go, oh, I would never move to an advantage plan or no or I, ha I have to keep this because i have to travel and they'll throw out one of these three or four objections right that we've already talked about today and so this is vitally important for you guys because it'll make you a lot of money i spent uh, or about 55 to 60 percent of my aep sales this aep were true ups that high so i was getting a double commission on that many people and those people, you not only do you make more money up front, but I also feel like they're more likely to stick, right? It's like you're, I'm their first guy that helped them get onto that. They trust me. They knew what I was talking about. And I had a good, those supplement people, instead of me being able to switch them in 15 to 20 minutes, like a quick plan change, maybe that call took me 45 minutes to an hour, but I, but they know that I knew what I was talking about and they're going to stick with me long-term. Do you guys feel like that same thing? You don't want to do that. You probably would have a chance to do You never travel. You're caught. You just sit in the poker and go out there. That person in the poker gets out there, gets upset. Now you know that they're engaged in the conversation. And then you start to talk. Yep. He's talking about finding their hot buttons. Yep. Yeah, you're trying to find that pain point. And if you can't find it, then you're probably not going to. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're just, they're sleeping there. And if people have no pain, sometimes they're on a supplement that works for them and they're happy with it, you know? What were you going to say, Rebecca? Um, no, I was just curious because when I was running in the OAP, so I mean, we're switching from advantage to advantage. What would we use? Like, is that something we could do right now? Like, what SCP would we use? Like, last year? Uh, yeah, so the, the disaster SCP is still open. SCP, oh, okay. DST, it's, you guys, this is, Quick aside, this is annual enrollment 2.0. This is AEP 2.0. You can switch anybody right now. You can put people off SUPS. You can you can switch plan changes. Just consider it like. So if someone just went from a SUPS in May, would that would we use a disaster? SCP? Yep, SCP DST. Okay. Has anybody had their DST special election code denied since AEP? There's not a, there's no such thing as a COVID SCP anymore. There's a disaster SCP. This whole country's a disaster. Look at what happened yesterday. So everything's a, everything's everything's a disaster. So and the carriers aren't advertising it. It's OEP, right? But we're smarter. We're the cream of the crop. We know if it, we use what if it's just a plan change, use OEP, guys. You don't want to have 50 sales in a month and they're all DST. But if you if there's not another valid election period, use that DST. It's going to work for you. Nobody's questioning what the disaster was. There's a disaster in every state, in every county, in every city right now, Alan. It's a disaster. They they changed it to where it's no longer FEMA declared. It's any disaster, and every state and every county has a disaster right now because of COVID or 
no choose your pick, take your pick. No. Nope. Cigna said that they may ask you for the date. So you might have to go Google and quickly say Fresno, California disaster declaration and put that date. Okay. So that's the only thing Cigna has said. So real quick, guys, I want to show you on Sunfire, everybody knows or should know how to make a drug list drug comparison, right? Okay. So let's say I'm talking to, I'm going to change this to be a, see what I called this? I called this guy Richard Badyear. This Because he, he uh, I remember this guy now. He didn't go to the doctor at all this year because of COVID. So he just hid in this hole and let all his conditions exacerbate. So he had no condition, he had no cost this year. So it was a really easy comparison because he would have saved like five grand. But he was like, well, what about last year? I went to the doctor, so I compared his bad year. So he knows that now if I did this on a two-year basis, if I said, Richard, over two years, you would have paid, you know, 9,500, but instead, you would have only paid zero this year and you paid 2,500, you would have saved $7,000 over two years. Plus you'd have got all these extra costs, you know, and that's how it works even with husband and wives. And you know, a lot of times you're saving them so much money that it makes it really easy. And then I close that with saying, and you get the other reason why I really like this. It's kind of the updated model. It's value-based care. Let me tell briefly explain to you what value-based care is. These doctors are compensated to take care of you. They, they do want to get you in and get your healthcare conditions taken care of. They do want to get you. So just know that you're, I think you're going to get better care on this. I don't close with saying, and you know, you're going to be limited by what doctors you have to go see. So this is going to kind of suck compared to that. I'm, I'm, I'm selling the actual legitimate value and benefit of that, of an advantage plan versus what they think they're losing. So let's go say, Pretty typical. What's someone paying for a plan F? Um, the other thing you guys need to consider too when you're talking to people is do supplements get cheaper as they age or do they what? They get way more expensive, right? And how about people's incomes? Do they start making more money as they get older? Nope. They start getting less, right? Or it's, or it's level or they start running out of money. So a lot of times, you know, I'll get people that are paying, they're like, oh, I'm going to get this plan F supplement because if anything ever happens to me, they pay for it for 10 years. They've never really taken full advantage of being able to have a supplement plan F. And now they're 75 years old. They're paying $280 a month for it and they can't afford it anymore. And they have to dump it anyway. And they just spent all that money, extra money over those 10 years without really ever fully utilizing it. Mm hmm. They now they throw it there. They're 66, 67. They're still on that little nice little gray shirt. Yeah. It's a little bit tougher. Shadow Pine did a really cool sale that I liked. Um, it was, she had a supplement and you were selling it on their welfare. Um, the welfare angel. It was a dividend flat. So I think it had a good effect on like $50 or something. And she's going to use that $50 to pay for a house by identity plan. She's mm -hmm. concerned about the Yep, and we can we can talk. Yep, we'll talk about at, you know leveraging as kind of like a last like I uh, putting on a, uh, an indemnity plan for people on supplements too. I'm gonna finish this comparison. So let's let's make a mock trial of pers of this person. How do people choose what drug plan they're on usually? Pick it out of the hat almost, right? Like they they don't they rarely compare very specifically what drug plan they're on. So let's say um, our client here is on, what's a popular drug plan here in Utah? Let's say they're on um, this United Healthcare AARP Medicare Saver Plus. It's 36.10 a month, okay? As a $445 deductible. So we'll go back to this. So 36.10 a month, AARP, they're, um, where they're going to take one we're going to do a comparison drug deductible so it's not monthly it's yearly 445 okay and he's on a plan f so i'll take that away so then let's add some costs of drugs let's say they're on 
What's a popular brand name drug? Xarelto. Xarelto, okay. And they're on the 15 milligram Xarelto, and they're on Bicinopril, because everybody is, and they're on Losartan. Okay, and they're on. If they're on metformin, are they diabetic or not? Okay. Okay, and where do I go get my drugs? I go to Smith's. Okay. All right, so I already know, real quick and easy, what plan did they say that we're on? The AARP. Okay, so my annual cost of drugs is right here, 1,708. So I can program that right in here. I'll just say drug full year, 1,708, okay. So for this guy, he's already out of cost $4,529 this whole year. Does that look right? Does he have dental? Okay, so we'll no, no, no dental, he just doesn't have anything. I'm just going to say he has no dental because that's pretty typical. Just they have no dental and they just have to pay for it. Okay, so now if I go over here and I go, okay, let's say if I put you on an advantage plan and I'm going to sort this by savings. Okay, have you get, do you guys know you can do that? by sorting it by savings, costs, or savings, okay? Right there, do you guys see that? I'm putting savings there. So this is this will sort it by which plan saves them the most money. So right here, if I put them on Molina, so in answer to your question, Alan, I'm gonna say Molina's actually gonna be the cheapest plan for you. Now here in Molina, here in Utah, IHC is not a network. So if they have IHC doctors all, I'm probably gonna move move on down um, or this right here if because I'm being savvy this Cigna is about saves them $800 but it's not factoring this into consideration right so 360 times 12 is an extra 360 so if I put them on Cigna that's actually going to save them the most money so what would that be 1160 1196 Plus nice. Yep. Cool. Okay. Twelve fifty six. So premium is zero, and then I'll put on here. I'll put Part B buyback. And I'm going to put this at negative thirty. Right. So I should drop that down. That's got a calculator. Okay, so Part B deductible, do not have to pay that Part B deductible. And let's say this guy, he went to the hospital for one day, stayed overnight, um, 290, the copayment on that's 330 on Cigna, plus he had an ER visit, that's 420, plus he went to two specialists, um, 35 each, that's $490. So this guy used quite a bit, and then he went to the primary care doctor a lot. Okay, so... His total costs for the whole year, and oh, I gotta look at his drugs. Yeah. His drug costs are 796. Is that how much he's saving the 796? I'll show you. That was a cost page, not Oh, yes, you're right. Sorry. You can have. Nine twelve. Okay. okay, so are we saving the money there? Yeah, we are. Okay, so if this guy, if I move this guy that had fairly amount of fairly high amount 
of usage from his plan F, his golden plan F, right, to a crappy advantage plan. It's a PPO. All his doctors are in network or out of network. And let's say a couple of his specialists were out of network. Great, he's paying 50 instead of 35 or 60 instead of 35. Add another 20 bucks onto there. His total cost would have been 1,042. This guy would have saved 3,487. Not only that, Richard, you'll have $2,000 towards dental. It's a full reimbursement. You can get all that dental work you need done. It has a $90 over the counter benefit. It pays for a gym membership for you. You have $200 towards glasses. You have um, hearing aid coverage and all these other things. What's the drawback? You know, what's the holdup? You're already, he's already almost paying his max out of pocket every year. That's his, too good to be true, man. But, but it's, but this is, this is, that's too good to be, yeah. Yeah, it's too, I, it is seller, right? I say yeah, you, it does sound too good, yeah. good, to yeah. good to be true. That's one of the hardest parts about my job is convincing people how it's too good to be true. And remember, the way that these Medicare Advantage plans work is every time you enroll in them, all of the money that the federal government has budgeted for you gets shifted onto this advantage plan on your behalf, right? And so they're able to take all that money that they have budgeted for you and build you a much better, full, robust plan. It's just a newer model. And that's why these have become so popular, Shane, over the past 10 years. And I kind of give them a backhanded, you're kind of dumb that you, you know, and, and guess what? If you don't like this, you have a one-year trial, right? Medicare knows that you like these, that you're going to like these, and they... They themselves are really pushing advantage plans. So they'll give you a one-year trial right. You can try this for up to a year. And if you don't like it, call me right back. I can put you right back on. And they're happy to take that $200 a month. That's my because there ain't no free lunch in life. Right? Yep. I, hey, I hear you. And that's what's the hardest part about my job is, you know, is convincing people how it's not too good to be true. But wait, call now. See? And then it's done. It's done. That is – and this is not – guys, this is not a once in a while – comparison right this is not a every once in a while it's like this is like more the rule than it is you know atypical so i you'll find people like this all the time whether they're you know newly on these supplements whether they've been on them for a long time and like dave said it's kind of counterintuitive because the older they are the easier and the more drastic these numbers are a lot of times you know i i switched to a lady's 89 year old mother or I, one of my Medicare client's mother, she was 89 on a plan J. She was paying that 390 on a J plus a drug plan. I'm like, she's already paying more than her max out of pocket is. So all you can do is, and, and, and it was, well, what about if she goes to this one doctor that's out of network, that's a specialist, then he, he pays an out of network cost on that, you know, that's slightly higher, costs you an extra 60 bucks. Who cares when you're saving, you know, 5,000 a year. So this is this is how I do it, and it's how I know a lot. All these other agents do it, but I and in answer to your question, um, Alan. So I first get into the com the cost comparison, and then I'll start looking up like which one would have been. I'll always compare their meds pretty quickly, because a lot of you guys and Dan talked about this the other day too. You're not taking the time to compare your meds, and so many of you are ingrained into just like, oh, well, I can get you $500 more of dental or I can get you some more over the counter. Do you want to switch? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Or they switch and then they find out that it's a pain in the butt to have switched. And then they call you guys and they want to switch right back because they realize that switching for an extra $300 worth of dental a year wasn't worth the pain in the butt of having to switch their insurance. And now they don't, this one doctor doesn't take it or whatever. But if you were, if they go fill their medications in January and instead of them paying $450, they're paying 80. They're like, well, that guy was, knew what I was talking, knew what he was talking about. Yeah. I'm going to send my friends to, to Russ. Okay. So any questions I'll, I know we kind of, it's not really boilerplate formatted, but if you use this comparison plan, so I, I get into the conversation. I just find out what people are doing. I ask them, you know, have you ever heard about these new programs in your area? Like, why are you not? I kind of innocently ask, like, well, why are you, why are you still doing that? You know, why are you still kind of on that old model? And again, I'm going to say, 
Go ahead. They heard online and was going there like, oh, I don't know the They like seem to have known about them, but they they just have these walls up, and it's hard to break them down. I try to say, if you let me at least explain and hear me out on this, I'll show you the statement. Some people have all the way too oh, high. Oh, you don't want to? Really, that's interesting. Why not? Most, you know, they're much more popular these days. What have you? What have you heard, or what? Why would you say that? And then they'll they'll give you their their reason right there. You know. No, just my neighbors say that. Yep, exactly. And and again, guys, I'm not saying you're going to sell every person on a supplement, right? And and again, just to follow that up, sometimes the supplement is the right thing for those people. You know, if there, there's a um, who was it that was here that heard me talk to that lady in uh, California and it was like a 45 minute call and we were like navigating all these, that was like an hour and 45 minutes. And I was like, this is going to be my best sale ever, you know? And at the end of it, I wasted an hour, not wasted, but at the end of an hour and 45 minutes, I was like, you know what? You just got to stay with what you're doing. You know, we'd explored all the options, talked everything through very much in detail. And I, I didn't feel good about like trying to really hard sell or hard close her on this advantage plan because I ultimately wanted to make sure the lady was um, doing the best thing for her. And when it comes down to if it's not a clear thing for me of which is right, I'm going to just let them do what they're currently doing um, because I don't want to ever harm people. I only want to help them. And so sometimes what they're doing, it's rare that, that you know, especially with like a drug plan. The other thing I want to tell you is, and we'll talk about supplements in detail and selling supplements and, you know, how to, which, when you need to, but a lot of you could probably sell them a cheaper supplement if yeah. that's what they, if, if, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the, always get a sale from mm -hmm. somehow. And this, there's, if they don't go with that, if they thought the trial right, what does the trial right say? Says that means there's no risk. So you're asking, you're asking is, do you feel like there's risk in changing the plan? Is there risk? I said, if I tell you there's a trial right by Medicare that says there is no risk, would that change your belief? Yeah. yeah. Or like, like what I was saying, if you want to quote them on a different supplement, on a different training, we'll cover CSG Actuarial, how we quote all the different supplement companies that you guys can quote. We, we sell Cigna and Aetna and Humana, United and Mutual of Omaha and I mean, pretty much any ones that you would actually care about. Yeah. Uh, and you can quote all of them and you can and you'll learn the difference between when it is going to be underwritten and when it could be guaranteed issue. Some states have what's called a birthday rule where every year on their birthday they can get guaranteed issue. But most of the time um, you're, they're going to go through underwriting. But if they're healthy and you have a healthy 72 year old, but. You can put her on Cigna and she can keep a plan G, but save $400 a month or $400 a year. A lot of times they'll do that too. And you get to sell that way. So try to sell them that advantage plan. If not, try to sell them a, a different, less expensive supplement. Try to help those people out, you know? Yeah. So I don't always do this, but if the majority of the people I've said have supplements to advantage, how likely to get the hospital energy plan mm -hmm. better cover they feel like they're on this side of the spectrum where they have the best coverage they can get, and they don't want to get one on this side, so I kind of position it as something in the middle where they pay a lot less monthly, so they're still, still covering for a hospital, or they're just still got cancer, and they're the cancer rider, but that's still the most part. But if you ever introduce those, if they bring up those concerns, that what like for the hospital? I. I Sometimes I do. Like if I feel like I'm not going to get that sale, I'll, I'll offer that as like, here's a hybrid option, right? And the only reason why is because then it, you're threading a needle with a more complicated sell again. And a lot of times on the indemnities, I'll try to sell those this time of year where I'll come back and be like, hey, I you know, hope you're happy with your advantage plan. I don't know if you are interested, but we do have this plan and program available for it. Um, I... I have advantage indemnities as a tool in my tool belt. It's not something that I try to sell everybody all the time. Um, and I, I'm not saying I don't, I'm, I, I don't like indemnity plans cause I do. And they're a good way to make some extra money, but I, 
it's not my focus. I think it's just as easy to quickly get a sale and, and move on. Um, I, I don't think my personal retention on an indemnity policy is not great. Um, I, I think 50% of them cancel in the first year for me. My frustration with indemnity plans is that the kids don't understand it or the parent or the person forgets what it is. Yeah. And, and so then you have to worry about like tracking down their premium because ETL is calling you or like I've, I've had at least 10 calls just this year of people I sold GTL where their kids called me or they've called me like, what, what was this? What did you do here? Yeah. And they just told me they don't understand it. Reason, but I've been with the GTLs for a few years now. But, but mine's a little bit higher. I've done probably a 70% retention on mine. But at the same time, um, yeah, you want to explain those, but uh, it's still a mess. It's still, it's still a great tool, especially one of the reasons I bring up my company is if someone's new, especially in business, it is a way to double your commissions. Your, yeah. Your yeah. Absolutely. Well, I like it. But again, you have to kind of know what you're doing, how to explain it. And so it is become more complicated. And so as long as you're okay and you're confident in how much are you really comfortable doing? Like, I did a lot of research and I'm not really well made. We'll, we're going to do a full training on those. It's like 200 a day in the hospital, so you're paying like 50 to 100 a month. Yeah, I know you do more training on them. Like like let's, let's not get too derailed by hospital indemnities right now, okay? We'll do a whole other training on those. Um, GTL and UNL, they're, they're anywhere from as cheap as 20 bucks a month to if you're just covering some hospitalization to... $150 a month, depending on how many add-ons and bonuses. It's like an AFLAC policy. And some people like to have the extra insurance and the peace of mind. Um, I just, like I said, I do sell them when the occasion comes up. I only sold three of the GTLs, this um, AEP. And so it's just something that I like to sell when I can, but it's not something that I'm proactively trying to push. Um, and I'm Again, I just, and that's an overall picture of knowing how many actually fall off the books and I'm dealing with chargebacks, how many extra customer service questions they generate. Like um, Chad was saying, the one that, one of the ones of the three that I sold, I've had to talk to her three or four different times about it so far. So I'm not saying they're, they're definitely good. And when you're wanting to add some extra instant cash in your pocket, they're a good way to do that. And they are good. It's one of the policies. Um, I Like I said, if I don't believe in it, I don't sell it. If it's a junk policy, the first indemnity that I ever sold was to an 87-year-old guy and his wife. And I was kind of like, oh, well, I got paid a good commission for those two. It was like 800 bucks because their premiums were kind of expensive. Um, the next month, the guy called me. He's like, yeah, I got hospitalized. Like, he was excited about it. Like, <laughs> well, I got hospitalized right after you sold me that. And they paid me 1500 bucks. And I was like, oh, cool. It does work, you know? And... Uh, <laughs> So those are one of the only, like, like we talked about standalone dental insurance yesterday. I'm not a huge fan of standalone dental because the amount of money and the commission that I make on those versus the, the customer service and the, and the client satisfaction is not worth it to me on most of those. So, um, but indemnities are one that I do. So does anyone have any questions about objections they get with supplements, how to sell them? Um, anything in general. I have one question. Well, well, you pay a lot of money every month and not have to pay a copayment occasionally. But well, these don't say I don't pay anything. I don't pay anything. Yeah. Say. I don't pay anything. Pay anything. Yep. Yeah. I'm too hand for that. <laughs> yep. And, it's funny. And, and again, you guys will get people just like anything that are obstinate and they don't want to listen. Don't don't keep banging your head against the wall. Like I said, I I usually try two or you know one or two different um, rebuttals and and kind of try to resolve their concern and take back control. And if it's not going anywhere, all right, great. I'm on on to the next. The worst case scenario, you lower their yeah. And then oh it would, well, if you if you like your supplement, great. When was the last time you checked your rate? Never. Well, great. I work with all of them available in the state. Let me quickly check. 
see what what may be cheaper for you if you want to keep that plan g they're like car insurance the only thing that's different is you know the, the company and what the premium is Sometimes home health and skilled nursing, they do like to bill original Medicare. Why? Because even though it's fee for service, they they pile on those line item fees and services and advantage plans go, come back to them and go, no, we're paying you a flat fee of this for those services. You're not going to bill me $22 for an aspirin and $18 for a needle and blah, 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 blah. And that's how, that's why. And I'll tell you this, skilled nursing and long-term care are in the crosshairs of Medicare. They're very heavily being looked at. Now, the fact that coronavirus decimated both of those industries kind of put that off, but Medicare is looking as far as fraud, waste, and abuse, skilled nursing facilities, home health care, and long-term care are the biggest, typically the biggest areas of offense for um, fraud, waste, and abuse in Medicare. So. Now, with the whole new affordable private, I would be seeing the 